This is the BearCast, presented by Bird Culture Ford. Bird Culture Ford has been in Waco since 1936. Ford is the number one selling truck in Texas, 43 years running. The BearCast is also presented by WellMed Medical Management and USMD Health System Dallas. Here's Craig Smoke and Grayson Grundhafer. What's up, everybody? Welcome into a brand new edition of the BearCast on Sikkim365.com, Sikkim365 Radio. I'm Craig Smoke, writer and host for Sikkim365.com, joined by Grayson Grundhafer, director of broadcasting, also team and recruiting reporter for Sikkim365. And it's a brand new week with a lot of basketball, a little bit of baseball, and a tiny bit of football to talk about. But uh, Grayson, before we get into it, how you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing all right. It was a busy week. Uh, it's kind of been that way for a while now, but a lot of different spring sports getting going. Softball had a good week. Baseball had a rough weekend uh, to start the year. Uh, basketball is in full effect, women's and men's. Um, it's a lot of fun, you know, not as much football stuff going on. That's more just the recruiting side of things right now. Uh, but the other sports seem to really be picking up some steam and that's been kind of fun to watch and cover just trying to see where these teams are going to end up at the end of the year. Yeah, uh, we're getting to the nitty gritty when it comes to hoops uh, in the end of the regular season, about to have conference tournament play here in less than a couple of weeks. And then uh, of course, a lot of the spring sports starting up. So we'll touch on baseball's opening weekend and a lot of that type of news, but let's start off with men's basketball. Uh, last night, Monday night, uh, the Bears, who now found themselves at number 10 in the country after the loss to Tech last week, uh, they found themselves in Stillwater to start the uh, week of festivities. And at 23, at 22 and 5 entering, uh, they were sitting in a good spot as far as, you know, Big 12 uh, rankings and standings and all of that. But uh, they also found themselves a bit shorthanded, uh, even more shorthanded in, in some cases, it feels like some nights than they were like the night before. Uh, but it's been a struggle. There's no doubt about that. And yet last night, maybe that's made, what made it so sweet was uh, the Bears got themselves a big win on the road, 66-64 over Oklahoma State. Adam Flagler with a huge night, 29 points, a career high for him. And it was James Akinjo with a Big pull-up jumper with uh, less than 20 seconds to go, less than 15 seconds to go in that game that gave the Bears their winning bucket, 66-64. They're now 23-5 and and 11-4 and in the Big 12 Conference. And, uh, well, how about Adam Flagler? How about James Akinjo? And how about that win? Yeah, I mean, my goodness. Where, where would this team have been last night without Adam Flagler? Um, 29 points. I mean, he was really their offense for a long stretch of that game. Played 41 minutes, despite the fact that he's clearly not 100%. He didn't play in the TCU game that they won uh, earlier on in the week, and or on the weekend, I guess, on Saturday. And so, yeah, I mean, it was really a gutsy performance by him. I was so impressed uh, by his just grit. And then also, like, James Akinjo played absolutely terrible for a long stretch of that game. Like he did not play well, was just clearly very off, was two of nine um, for the game, 0 of three from three, but he showed up in overtime and really took that game over um, and was so aggressive. And honestly, that shot that he hit is one of those shots that you go, that translates to March. Like that play right there, that's the kind of play that translates to March Madness and guards win NCAA championships. And for him to hit a shot like that, it's really cool to see. Hopefully it gets his confidence going. Hopefully it gets them going in a, a good direction. Um, and it was just an amazing performance, an amazing win over a mediocre Oklahoma State team, sure. But Baylor's dealing with a lot right now with injuries, the roster, the way it is, just trying to overcome all of those things and figure out how they're going to win games. And they found a way to win one, a, a really tough one in a tough environment. Yeah, and uh, Baylor fans dealing with some heart problems there at the very end, thinking that there was a buzzer beater to win the game. Game. The officials go back to review it, and uh, no basket. They go to overtime, and Baylor's able to get the win. But uh, there was a moment there where you thought not only did they lose and lose to, a, like you said, a very average team in, in Oklahoma State that the NCAA has already told them you're not going dancing. Uh, so that's you know part of their struggles, I think, all year is just having known from the outset, like, y'all aren't going to the dance no matter what you do. That, that couldn't have helped matters. But, yeah, I mean, they, they were on the verge of getting themselves a big win. And, uh, you know, then you get to the review and you, you never know how that's going to go. Uh, although, you know, you get pretty clear shots still. We've seen scenarios where you're like, 
you know, you walk away, you're like, how did that happen? But anyways, they got it right. Scott Drew was happy they got it right. And, uh, and you know, the ba- the Bears got to get to overtime and, and got themselves a win as a result. Yeah, I was sitting there going, this if, if that had counted, <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, he likely just threw it up from behind the backboard, he basically, yeah. and it just happened to go in. I was like, if they lose like that on a play where he literally just wasn't even really trying to make it, he just kind of threw it up. That would have just been heartbreaking, right? And so oh, they, gosh. they found a way to get it done, and I was proud of them. They didn't play well shooting the ball. They didn't play well, you know, for long stretches of the game offensively. They grinded it out defensively, uh, just played as tough as they could. I mean, th- this was a brawl, right? This was an absolute brawl. And again, Baylor found their way to win, and this is huge. You know, it keeps them right there in the conference picture heading into Saturday where – um, you know, they're going to have to play extremely well if they're going to beat that Kansas team, even in the Farrell Center, with just kind of the odds stacked against them, the roster the way it is. Um, and, you know, Scott Drew's comments this week don't seem great about LJ Cryer's availability going forward either. So um, I don't know what's going to happen this weekend, but what I do know is Baylor's 11 and 4 in conference, 23 and 5 on the year, and a team that still has hopes going forward. Yeah, what was his latest comment now? Still just pain tolerance? Yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll read the, the exact okay. quote. So he actually told Smokey this on Sikkim 365 Radio. Um, in quotes, I think we will have more information in the next week. Um, so to know what the exact game, or so to know what the exact game plan is with him, uh, up to that point, it was a pain threshold thing, uh, up to that point being the TCU game. Uh, but sometimes you have to reevaluate that and see what you're going to do going forward. Um, he said LJ Cryer was a game time decision. Uh, I think that quote was basically like, I knew he wasn't going to play that night, but now it's a matter of this week. I think because he has a full week, you know, Monday all the way till the game on Saturday to figure out, is this going to be a pain tolerance thing? Or are they going to have to shut down LJ Cryer for the year is what it sounds like. Yeah. Uh, well, it's just been that type of a season, quite frankly, where, you know, every time you start to get excited about something, there's some injury or some other, you know, uh, performance that, that you get uh, worried about or concerned over. So, yeah, last night they basically played with seven players. I mean, eight technically, but uh, Jordan Turner only played four minutes. Uh, and, and so, yeah, he, he was the eighth man <laughs> uh, last night, but Thamba plays 32 minutes, Kendall Brown 33 minutes, Flagler 41, Akinjo 39 minutes, Sohan 37 minutes, Matthew Meyer 25, Dale Bonner 14, and then uh, Jordan Turner. And that's their team right now. That's what they're that's what they're working with. Those eight guys, uh, at least as of last night. Yeah, I think this is what it's going to be. And I don't even know if Turner's really going to even play four minutes every night. Yeah, it just. It just seems like these are the guys that are going to be on the court, and really, it's going to come down to for Matthew Meyer. They need him to score better. He is what, like, it's just so tough because, like, he has moments where you go, man, that's really good. Like, Matt doing his thing, really helping ele- elevate this team. But you're waiting on the moment where he goes out and scores 20 something points. And that allows this team to have that third offensive weapon that they really need. They need a consistent third weapon. And I, I love Sohan, but he he has moments where he's a freshman. You know, he has a six-point game in this one, was 3 of 11 from the floor. They really need Meyer to even do more than just 12 points. You know what I mean? And, and I think that should be the expectation for him this late in his career that he has better performances than he's had so far this season. It, it's kind of been underwhelming, to be honest. Yeah, uh, it has been, uh, you know, maybe the way he was he was kind of hyped up coming back and the fact that he's an NBA prospect who decided to come back to college for another year. You just kind of figure with the exodus that he'd be a guy who steps into kind of the leading role. But, you know, some people just aren't cut out of that that cloth, you know, personality wise. And, um, you know, I think just period, people just want to see him score points. However, it gets done, you know, no matter if he's the fifth lead score or whatever just want to see him score points but Flagler last night not only those those points that he scored all 29 of them but he's taking charges in overtime I mean he's got like two massive calls there in the extra period that um just you know everything played into that win last night so yeah uh, as, as Scott Drew said after the game you know the, the trainer is their MVP yeah. because of uh you know just availability that they had every single ounce of what they could get on the court last night ended up mattering in that game so huge huge victory for the the men's basketball team 66 64 in overtime over Oklahoma State who is uh, just trying to 
finish above or at 500 uh, for the regular season. Of course, no postseason for them because of a uh, NCAA ruling. Uh, but the Bears now, what, in third place in the Big 12? Uh, or second, second place, yeah. excuse me, uh, in the Big 12. Half game above Texas Tech, even though Tech has both wins over Baylor. Uh, but yeah, KU coming up for the Bears. And uh, yeah, I mean, like, dude, you think that they lost like 10 games this year based on the way everybody kind of <laughs> reacts to them, honestly. And, and that's the hard part when you won a national title. And, and then you, you know, you kind of are somewhat guilty on your own of, and maybe not so much Scott Drew and stuff, but, you know, they were very high on this team coming in. And uh, I know some people were higher on this team than they were on last year's team in some cases. I never quite saw that, but, uh, you know, you could see little moments maybe where, where that makes sense. But regardless, I mean, they're, they're in no way, shape, or form in the same shape that last year's team was uh, at this time period. So that's going to be the story here, man, is like how much can they squeeze out of what they have available when they have it available. Uh, but that would have been a devastating loss last night, and instead it was a big-time win. So congratulations to the men on uh, going ahead and getting that one done. And, you know, now it's on to the, to the next one, which is number five, Kansas at home, coming up here on Saturday. Yeah, college game day is going to be in the house. That's going to be a lot of fun. I encourage Baylor fans, you know, that, that Farrell Center needs to be full capacity for that game. They, they really need the crowd in that one. So I'm hoping as many Baylor fans as possible get into the arena for that game. I mean, it, it's going to be a great experience, I think. I, I believe the crowd's going to play a huge role in that game. Um, and, you know, they're playing a Kansas team that's 11-2 and two right now. Um, they're in conference. They, they've looked really good. Uh, knocked off West Virginia on the road by double digits. Uh, beat up on Oklahoma State by 14 as well. Uh, squeaked by Oklahoma. But... They've had inconsistencies. Kansas is beatable. Now, I know when Baylor played them, they looked <laughs> unbeatable, but they are beatable. Baylor can beat that team. Um, the question is what Baylor team is going to show up on Saturday and who's going to be available on Saturday. That, that's really the biggest thing. Um, if the Bears do pull off the upset, because I do think it would be classified as an upset, um, they'd pull within one game of Kansas and be right there. All they would need is a slip up from Kansas and then to win out, which is realistic for them to get a share of the Big 12 title. Um, it's a big one. It's one that I know this team probably circled early on in the season, and if they didn't, they definitely circled it after the absolute drubbing they took um, just a month ago, basically, less than a month ago. Um, I'm really excited. I think this is going to be a tremendous effort. I think this is going to be a game where you watch Baylor play and you go, they really want this game. They're playing their tail off, and hopefully it leads to a win. They're, they're going to have to play really well, though. This Kansas team's very good and look like uh, they're going to be a lock for a one seed, so Baylor's going to have to play well. Yeah, they will. So we'll see what happens. But uh, obviously to have home crowd support would be huge. It's a weekend game, so none of that. Well, it's the weeknight and everybody lives out of town. Like, hey, it's a Saturday game, so you got an opportunity to be there if you live out of town. And, uh, yeah, it'll go a long way to have a good showing, uh, not only in the game but at the game as well. So Kansas coming up on Saturday for uh, the Baylor men who currently sit right there. Uh, Perched is second, and uh, with the win against Kansas, that would make things quite interesting with just a couple of regular season games left to go. So that's a that's a big one coming up for Scott Drew and company, but a really nice win over Oklahoma State. Meanwhile, the uh, Baylor women now up to the number five team in the country, twenty one and five on the year. Uh, their latest win over TCU, seventy eight to fifty nine, to move them to twenty one and five on the year. They bump up two spots in the top 25, and they've reeled off now six straight wins, uh, including back-to-back -back victories over TCU. They will hit the road on Wednesday for a meeting in Stillwater with Oklahoma State. They've got Kansas, then a road trip to Iowa State, which is a, a big Big 12 game that'll be coming up next week, and then Texas Tech at home to close it out. But uh, yeah, at Oklahoma State coming up on uh, Wednesday. Uh, but man, six straight victories for the Baylor women and they had that ugly 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 loss to Oklahoma that was just that was just a terrible terrible loss and to their credit they've rebounded nicely but if not for that they'd be on like a 12 game winning streak right right now uh so yeah that's uh where they sit and uh liking what you're seeing and and are you uh a bit more optimistic about the direction of this uh, lady Bear, or this Baylor women's team. Not that you were pessimistic yeah. about them, but um, how are you feeling about them at the moment? Yeah, I mean, they've won 11 of their last 12, and they're looking really good in Big 12 play. They kind of got the 
the little help that they needed as can as Texas just demolished Iowa State earlier last week, 73 to 48. Um, just crushed Iowa State, and that allowed Baylor to now be tied for first place. Um, it's really interesting because remember early on in conference play, they beat Kansas, and I think a lot of people shrugged that off as like a, oh, they beat Kansas, you know, whatever. They're one and two in Big Twelve play, no big deal. Well, Kansas is nineteen and five and ten and four, currently third in the conference right now. Uh, so that was actually ended up being a, a much bigger win than I think people believed at the time on the road. Um, and now you look at Baylor's schedule. And we've talked about this for a while, right? Their schedule really cleared up after that four-game stretch. So they they beat West Virginia, TCU, and then TCU again with ease. They get a really, really bad Oklahoma State team who's 3-11 and in conference play um, tomorrow. So they'll probably win that game. And then you have that two-game stretch where you get Kansas in Waco, and then you go to Iowa State. Um, so two big swing games before finishing up with Texas Tech. Uh, I'm expecting this team to win out. I really do. I think they've hit their stride right now. They're playing at a very high level. But at worst, I see them going 3-1. and one, And I think 3-1 and one gives them a share of the Big 12 title, which, I mean, you got to be optimistic when you see that in year one. I don't care about the talent they had. I know they're talented. I know they probably have the number one overall pick in Nelissa Smith. But what Nikki Collin has done in year one is phenomenal, and it's not something that happens very often where you go to a program in year one, you're able to keep up with the standard that has been set at that program. And I think she's done a fantastic job of that. And really the only expectation was find a way to win the Big 12 was a lot of people's expectation, and she's found a way to put them in a spot where uh, they they should be considered in the driver's seat at the moment. Yeah, you know, uh, I was very careful to not, at the first sign of adversity, jump off the ship with Nikki Collin. Uh, a lot of people did that. <laughs> they like, The first, you know, couple losses, they're like, this is already like our season total every year. And, you know, oh my gosh, this is going to fail or whatever. I saw all sorts of things. I saw also support too. I saw a lot of those, those rats quick to jump off ship. And uh, I think they're trying to climb back aboard uh, in some cases because here they are at the end of the year and they're right there in a position to to win this whole thing again. And if they do, I, I mean, I know that, like, like you said, and I've been saying this on the radio, like just because you change coaches doesn't mean that the standard changes. You know, the standard stays the same. And, you know, you would give her a little bit of leeway and not expect like to come right away uh, into the Big 12 and, and win like Kim was winning. You know, I mean, that, that takes a little bit of time. But, man, for as rocky as it felt like when they were dealing with COVID and just that early part of the year and you had like – random roster departure and 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 shoot quite frankly since that roster departure uh they've been really really good uh so yeah it's been fun to see them kind of get some confidence and play well together and, and figure themselves out and uh, i really enjoyed our conversation with nikki collin um i guess that was uh last friday i think it might have been but it was pretty in depth and uh the most we've heard from her on our show in, in quite some time. So that was uh, that was fun to, to have that discussion with her. And it's been fun to see what they're doing. So, yeah, they're uh, right there in the thick of things and right there at the uh, top of the standings and in the in the heat of the race. Yeah, and she I think she mentioned she bought a house in Waco, yeah. right? I mean, she's locked into this program. So, again, this is a, this is a time for Baylor fans to really rally around the new coach because Nikki is doing a great job. This team's doing a great job. And, honestly, I mean, they look like the best team in the Big 12. And they look like they're going to have an opportunity to win out and win the Big 12. And if you went out with only three losses in conference, that's pretty good. Now, I know Kim was doing it with like one loss or going undefeated in the Big 12. That's fine. But this team is really finding creative ways to win. And they're utilizing a roster that doesn't have a ton of depth. And they're still finding ways to win games. And like you said, they're number five in the country now. Uh, I think if they win out, they're going to have an opportunity to get a number one seed. Uh, I don't think that's out of... The question, they could probably lose once and they'll probably end up on the two seed line. Uh, but if they went out, they'll be a one seed. And I mean, <laughs> what else can you hope for in year one? That that would be spectacular to win a regular season title and then get a one seed. That's ridiculous. But even a two seed and say they don't win the regular season, but they win the Big 12 tournament, that's a heck of a first year, uh, no matter how far they go in the tournament. 
Yeah, if they get a title of some sort, that'd be uh, pretty massive. So here they are uh, with just, what, three games, four games to go. Yeah. And uh, right there in the mix. Uh, and number five now in the country. So uh, we will see how it plays out. Uh, just like with the men uh, in front of them, for what it's worth, South Carolina is the unanimous uh, AP number one, Stanford number two, NC State three, Louisville four, and then there's Baylor. And uh, you got Iowa State at nine. So that's who they'll be facing here pretty soon. Texas is at 11. You just beat them twice uh, less than two weeks ago in three days. So, yeah, uh, Big 12 with three of the top 11, and uh, the Bears, that top team at number five. Elsewhere, uh, not so good <laughs> opening weekend for Baylor baseball hosting Maryland uh, to kick off the season. And uh, Steve Rodriguez and the Bears find themselves in an 0-3 hole to start the year, swept at home uh, to open the year against the Maryland Terrapins. 4-0 uh, on Friday night. Uh, they fell in their season opener. Then 9-5, they go down on Saturday. And then, uh, yeah, I said 9-5. I thought I was saying it backward. I, there's a, I have a pet peeve. Never, like the most homer thing you can do is say the – the team that you're covering first, if they're the losers, like if you oh, ever heard people yeah. do that, it's like Baylor lost 13 to 16. It's like no, they lost 16 to 13. Like yeah. it's just been in a pet peeve of mine. So I thought I said that wrong for a second, but yeah, they lost nine to five to Maryland on Saturday, eight four on Sunday. So zero uh, and three start. They'll get Houston Baptist coming up tonight in uh, those little midweek tilts that we'll be seeing from here until you know the summertime starts basically, and then they will play host to Duke. Uh, coming up this weekend, who is ranked number 23 in the country. So a top 25 weekend series in Waco. So uh, don't don't uh, get your get your bearings about you. You could be like in an 0-6 or 1-6 or 0-7 type of hole uh, with Duke coming in. But, uh, yeah, Grayson, obviously not the start that they wanted against Maryland uh, to kick off the year. No, definitely not. I mean, they, the runs were at a premium in the first game, and Tyler Thomas pitched really well. I think coming out of the weekend – I was really excited to see that he came out and really had a nice performance in that first matchup against Maryland. I was impressed by him. And I, you know, I think everyone has been for a while, uh, just kind of waiting for him to really emerge as, man, this is the guy. And I mean, six innings, nine strikeouts, only two earned runs. He was fantastic. And if he continues to pitch like that, I really think this team's going to be fine. I mean, he, he would give them an ace on Friday nights. Um, other problem, you know, elsewhere, they got to figure out their Saturday guy. They got to figure out their Sunday guy, pitching-wise. They got to figure out the rotation there, and they got to figure out their hitting, um, especially hitting for power. I know that's been mentioned a lot, but it, it's just an area where you look at their roster and you go, man, there's just not a lot of power hitters on this team. Obviously, Jared McKenzie is a first-team consensus All-American, uh, but outside of him, they just they don't have a ton of weapons that have emerged yet. Now, I do see some potential on this team, but I just, I, I'm a little concerned about the power area. They're going to have to hit really well for average. And obviously, that's really hard to do when you face really good pitching. It's hard to get a ton of hits off really good pitchers. You got to be able to make those hits count. And so, uh, a little bit concerned about that coming off of this weekend. But again, I think everyone needs to take a deep breath. Uh, this Baylor team went on a lot of runs last year. I was telling Jack this, they had two runs of nine or more games last season, two winning streaks of nine or more games. Baseball is a very momentum oriented sport. Um, so it happens a lot. You know, you lose a few games in a row and then you come back and win a few games. I think right now, the important thing is you got to go beat Houston Baptist. Houston Baptist just got demolished by Rutgers 4-0, 18-3, and 10-5 over the weekend. So there is no doubt this is a must win tonight. And yeah, you can say must wins don't matter. This is one of the worst. This is probably the worst team on their schedule. So you got to find a way to win this one. And then you got Duke this weekend. So you get an opportunity to make up for your mishap to start the year. Go out, win that series, and finish the week at 500. You know, if you can finish the week, you're sitting there at 500. I think you got to feel pretty excited about that. Or near 500, I guess. You'd be three and four, right? If they were able to win two and win the... Houston Baptist game. No, so, it'd be three and four. Yeah. Three and four. So you'd be just shy of it. But again, if they come out three and four after getting swept the first week, and I think you, you would feel very happy about that, especially because Duke's a top 25 team. Maryland's now a top 25 team as well. Uh, so two very quality opponents, which is something Baylor hasn't really had in the past. You know, in recent years, they've played all these cupcake games early 
and you go, if you lose any of them, you're losing so much ground when it comes to RPI. But since they're playing high-end teams, you have real opportunities to pile up some really quality wins. You just got to find a way to get it done. So, uh, baseball now underway, and uh, we will see what they do with the, this midweek tilt and then the top 25 Duke Blue Devils coming to town this weekend. Uh, make sure you get on at the ballpark if you get an opportunity to do so. Although, I'm not sure what the weather's supposed to be like. I know it's it's like great right now. By tomorrow, it's supposed to be back to Antarctica Cold. levels, and then I, I don't know what the weekend looks like. They moved up uh, Friday's game. What do oh, so it was going to be bad be at night, okay. but they moved it to, to the day. Well, that, so, yeah. that answers that. And it's supposed to be bad weather, I guess, uh, potentially this weekend. I know it, it is turning cold again, but hopefully here late February, we're just like a couple of weeks away from just breaking through this thing. And then we'll start complaining about the heat here in a few weeks. And then, you know, that's that's what we do. We just complain about everything. It's too cold, it's too hot. But that is kind of the time period that we're in right now. So like it's the end of winter sort of, but it'll go from eighty to forty in fourteen hours time. You gotta, yeah. you gotta love living really in quick. Texas. <laughs> yeah. You gotta love living in Texas. So uh there's that with uh baseball, uh softball six and two on the year. Uh they just finished up a uh uh, a win, uh, or excuse me, a series over a uh, series with Oregon uh, took the opening game and then uh, dropped the next two uh, last Friday, Saturday, uh, fr- Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I uh, got that opening. I got that opening win on Friday. Lost it again on Friday. I'm sorry. Had a double header and then lost again on Saturday. So one and two against Oregon. And now they will have UT Arlington coming up uh, later on tonight at six o'clock. So softball in the swing of things as well. And then that now brings us to men's tennis, the number three men's tennis team suffering their first loss of the year, going down to the Tennessee Volunteers in the Indoor National Championship semifinals. Uh, They reached the finals last year, fell short indoor and outdoor, uh, reached the indoor semifinals, and uh, can't quite make it back to that final this time around, uh, falling, like I said, to uh, number two, Tennessee. So only two teams ranked above them, and they lost to one of those two teams ranked above them in the Vols. But uh, obviously a very good group and just... They're, they're knocking on the door, man. You keep knocking enough, you hope that eventually that sucker just breaks down for you, but it's just not time for that just yet. Yeah, and this is the tournament that they've had so much trouble with, this indoor. For some reason, they just can't get that monkey off their back where they win the indoor championships, and that's okay. You know, the the one in... in uh, the spring matters more, the outdoor one. But, you know, it would have been nice, right, to go out, get the indoor championship. And they lost to Tennessee, the team that they beat in the semifinals of uh, the outdoor last season. So, um, yeah, I mean, they're 13-1. and They're really, really good. They're a top three team in the entire nation. And I I think they're going to finish really strong. Um, you know, it was interesting. They, they, a lot of their guys who hadn't lost all year finally lost in this matchup against Tennessee. Um, I think that's a good thing. You're not going to go undefeated throughout an entire tennis season, most likely. Um, so they get that loss off their backs and now they can regroup focus going forward. And I still think they have a great opportunity to make a semifinal, make the finals, win a, uh, NCAA championship in tennis. Michael Woodson continues to have that program trending in the right direction. And, you know, a loss to a top three team is not that big of a deal. It happens, right? It's their first loss of the year. They'll be all right. They'll figure it out and they'll get it back. And and I'm not too worried about it, but it is a bummer, right? Because you want to win those. You want to win every match. Hey man, like I say all the time, like I, I'm a big believer in this. You know, every you know, at some point you gotta win. Like you, yeah. you know, when you have the opportunities to do so, you don't want to be the Buffalo Bills. You know, that's my thing. It's like, oh, the Bills got their, oh, they'll get back, they'll win it at that time. You got back three. Surely they're going to win it their third time. Okay, fourth time they've got to win it, and then they've never been back. You yeah. know, so those opportunities when you get them, they are so important. Like Oklahoma football, uh, seven national titles. Uh, at one point, that would have been you know top three ish. You know, although like, the USC's and some of those schools have like ten and a plus or whatever. But I mean, that, like very good mark at seven. They could have like 12 right now, but they've lost their last five national title appearances. So it's like now Ohio State's passed them. Now, you know, now Alabama's like doubled them up in that same time frame. So, yeah, man, I mean, you get there, you got to take advantage of it. I have no doubts they'll be back, and at some point they will. Just, uh, yeah, they've, they've uh, come up just short these, uh, these last 
what, three opportunities, the two indoors and the outdoor. So we'll see what happens to the outdoor. Uh, maybe they change their fortunes there, but uh, no doubt the tennis program's in very good hands right now. And, uh, yeah, you're not, you're not mad about being the number three team in the country. So they'll be back on Sunday taking on Oklahoma up in Norman. So that's what's up next for men's tennis. But, uh, yeah, wish you could have gotten a, gotten a national title. That would have been pretty nice. They got wins over Ole Miss and Kentucky uh, in that tournament before falling to Tennessee. So a lot of SEC flavor there. All right, uh, football-wise, uh, typically that's what we would start off with, but there's not really a lot going on right now in regards to football. I mean, there's workouts. They're posting workouts. Somebody actually had a question about uh, something they saw in one of those workout uh, graphs or I guess the chalkboard thing that they put out, this little picture of who performed at each position the, the best that day. Uh, but I guess recruiting is really the main thing for – the next few weeks until we'll get to pro day and spring football here relatively shortly. That's all on the horizon now at this point, but uh, anything of note, um, you know, there's no contracts to talk about, which is kind of nice. Uh, there's no transfers to talk about really. Uh, so yeah, it's just kind of that, that little bit of a lull right now, but uh, anything on the recruiting side that's worth uh, mentioning. Yeah. So I thought, you know, there's a few interesting things as far as offers go, but I think the first area that I want to bring up, and this is something that I got questions about and people have talked about a little bit, but it seems like Baylor's pretty set on taking two tight ends in this class. And I think people have real question marks about that because, you know, they took three last year and it seems like they're building out you know this tight end group a little bit and you know why are you taking so many you already have one committed in hawkins poly why are they trying to take another one um but i think at the end of the day this staff really wants to utilize that tight end position a lot more and if you look at the depth chart you know you have ben sims who will probably be gone after next year you have drake dabney but i mean that's pretty much it Outside of that, you got a lot of young guys, Kelsey Johnson, Co Cody Mladinka, Kyan Roberts Day. Um, they really need to build depth there, especially when you're talking about a team that would like to have three kind of unique tight ends, right? So uh, technically, Dylan Doyle is their H-back right now, and that's not ideal. You know, you want to have a guy that's actually set in that role. That's what a lot of people feel Kelsey Johnson would be best at. I could see that. But they have roles, right? And they could come out in three tight end sets, which they did at times last year. So you have to have depth at the position, which is why I think they're focusing on it so much. Um, you know, they've put out multiple offers at the position. Um, when you talk about Reed McKeska uh, out of Bridgeland, he's a guy that visited for junior day. He's a guy who's been on their radar for a long time, it feels like now. Um Matthew Klopfenstein out of Arizona. He's out of Scottsdale. He's going to visit in March for a practice. He'll come down and and give the Bears a little bit of a tour and see kind of what's going on there. And uh, Lafayette Kaiwe, uh, he's a guy that's kind of blowing up as well at the tight end position. So I guess my main comment there is Baylor wants two tight ends in this class, and they really want to focus on that position because it's a position that the staff feels like they're lacking depth at and that they could go out and – add some more quality guys at the position. So just don't be surprised when signing day rolls around and maybe there's two two tight ends. I mean, if there's three, that would be, I feel like, a lot. But if there's two, don't be surprised. I think that's where things are trending right now at the tight end position. All right, so uh, there's a little bit to chew on when it comes to football uh, right now. Just, again, recruiting and uh, kind of counting down the days to, uh, to pro day, spring ball, all that good yeah. stuff. And I have one more note okay. kind of recruiting wise. They did. I think y'all asked me about this. I feel like a long time ago on the radio show, um, you asked me about Juco, you know, is Juco recruiting going to be a thing anymore? Is that kind of taken away because of the transfer portal a little bit? And Baylor actually put out their first Juco offer of the 2023 cycle, uh, Hutchinson Community College 2023 wide receiver Malik Benson. That's their first Juco offer in this class. Um, and there's a reason for it. <laughs> this guy, 43 receptions for 1,229 yards and 11 touchdowns. Mm. That's 28 and a half yards per reception. I mean, the guy is an absolute blazer, had a 10 400 meter time in high school, a 21-6, uh, 200 meter, and a 25-2 uh, long jump, which is elite. That's like college track level times, uh, pretty much all of that, and measurements. So uh, he didn't go anywhere 
uh, out of high school because his grades weren't there. Uh, apparently, they are there now. He's building a good relationship with Dallas Baker and Eric Mateos. Uh, already has offers from Kansas State, Missouri, Texas Tech. Um, but is a guy that I, I think Baylor would be very interested in. And obviously, he's a blazer. He's a guy who would be an early enrollee because he would graduate in December from Hutchinson. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's just interesting to see that this is their first JUCO offer. And in the past, they extended so many JUCO offers, it felt like when Rule was here especially. Yeah, they like to get the guys that were seasoned and ready to go a little bit quicker. Yeah. Uh, rather than having those, you know, freshman and sophomore years where you're kind of building them up and building their bodies, you just plug and play uh, a little bit uh, better. And uh, yeah, I guess what was the last Juco guy they took? Was it Victor Obi? I think, uh, well, and Al, right? Al Walcott. Oh, yeah. Al Walcott, too. yeah. Um, so, I mean, they've had success there, right? I mean, it's not, it's not like there's no success at the Juco's position, but. Um, you know, I, there were some others that didn't didn't, didn't quite pan out. Um, Zuazua is one that comes to mind. Yeah. Um, you know, and they've had some issues. Never even too, saw him again, man. Uh, I, I have no idea what happened to that kid. No uh, clue. The last time I saw him, he was in a tiff over something uh, after the Dave Aranda press conference. It was wild. Like, yeah. I did not, not like a. <laughs> It was like I saw him, and I think I've told this story in the podcast before, but like everybody had wrapped up, or he had wrapped up his introductory press conference, and everybody's standing around, and there's a bunch of people like meeting and greeting Dave Aranda and whatever. I remember seeing the Andre Zuzwa, and he was like trying to, I think, get in there and talk to him or something like that, but he got like super impatient. I don't know if he had a class to get to or whatever, but I don't know. He just had like this, this, you could tell he was like upset by something, and I didn't quite know what it was because I was just kind of, just happened to be in the vicinity. And that's the last time I saw him. <laughs> I was, yeah. Like he was upset about something I thought. Um, and then, you know, I, I just never saw him again. Cause he wasn't on the team for much longer after that. And I don't know what ended up happening to that young man. Hopefully he's doing well, but uh, yeah, that was one of those that you got high hopes for, but you kind of knew it was risky. And you know, ultimately you didn't really get what you wanted. Yeah. And that 2020 class, you also had most Jeffrey as well. Yeah. So, I mean, OB Jeffrey and, um, and uh, who was the one I just mentioned? Zuzwa. Uh, no, no, no. Um, Walcott. Walcott, all in that class. And so, but since then, it's been pretty much non-existent. And that's yeah. kind of around the time when the transfer portal picked up, right? So it's just something to monitor, I think, going forward, is just how active they're going to be uh, offering JUCOs. But obviously, when you're talking about Malik Benson, that's a no-brainer offer. I mean, his his film is amazing. And obviously, the measurements and everything that Baylor also really, really likes to see out of athletes, he has grades were the only thing holding him back. So uh, excited to see that. Um, that's pretty much the main things on recruiting-wise. I will say just a, a brief mention, they did offer a 388-pound uh, nose tackle uh, out of Atascacita. Uh, I don't even want to get his name wrong, but uh, Samu Tom and Pepe, Tom and Pepe, 388 pounds. Wow. And I've heard reports that he might be bigger than that. So, I wow. mean, this is a big dude, like Siaki Ika mold. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, let's see what happens. Uh, yeah. Don't know much about him, but uh, 380 pounds, that's a, that's a whole lot of weight to carry around. First team all district. I mean, really good player. No surprise they offered. Fits their scheme really well. But that's the main things recruiting-wise right now. It's kind of a, a slow period. I will say they did get off their restriction, their uh, two-week restriction of communication this weekend. Uh, so yeah. finally have been able to talk to recruits again and open things up uh, in that regard. I think most of their penalties are served out now. Um, they're, they're looking like they're in a pretty good spot outside the official visits. Obviously they got a little restriction there, but a uh, good spot with the penalties as well. And I think momentum will start picking up when guys come and visit for spring practices and et cetera. All right. So there's a little bit on football and uh, recruiting and they'll start getting back into a, a you know, the regular grind and practices uh, here in the next few weeks. So let's get in the mailbag to close it out. You'll have some football questions. We'll start off with Scotty B. Notice the football strength and conditioning Twitter account had Josh Fleeks as a running back, not receiver, as one of the top list lifters last week in a tweet. What are your thoughts on Josh Fleeks potentially moving to running back? Yeah, I think we talked about this uh, kind of when we first just kind of knew that he was potentially making that move to running back. He did a lot of things at running back in the spring last year and in the fall last year as well. So. I don't know if I would say this has been in the works for a while, but I think it's definitely been considered an option for a while. And I'm curious about it. You know, I'm curious to see how he does in that regard. He's not as big as like an Abram Smith. And I don't know if he has the power to be like Abram Smith. And 
Honestly, every time I see him do jet sweeps, I feel like he's trying to bounce stuff to the outside. So he never better works. Get, it yeah. never works. He better find a way to get downhill and become physical if you're going to run, you know, with the first string in this type of offense. But I will say in the open field, he's very fast. You know, he's very fast, has great explosiveness, but it's just a matter of can he cut, get downhill, and can he break tackles? You know, can he avoid getting wrapped up by the first contact, which has been something he really hasn't excelled at in his time at Baylor. So I'm curious. It clearly means they're looking at all options at running back, and it clearly means that they might be looking at one in the transfer portal as well. Yeah, I, I don't know what their sights are set on as far as the portal goes, but, I mean, they might as well have with Fleeks because, you know, he wasn't doing anything at wide receiver. I mean, that was really – um, so profound that you're like, well, yeah, chalk him up to being one of the top receivers. No, I mean, so, I mean, get him where he can get in there and make an impact because he's he's short on time now at this point. I mean, honestly, I was talking about him, and I was not saying this because of any rumors I had heard, but just when Joey McGuire left for Texas Tech and you're thinking of, like, who could potentially join him? Josh Fleeks made sense because he's a Cedar Hill guy and because, quite frankly, he's not seeing the field a ton or at least statistically making a massive impact for Baylor. So with time kind of running short and maybe not being as much of a fit in this offense, you wondered, like, at least I did, like, hey, he would make sense to go out to Lubbock or just somewhere else. I mean, somewhere else that maybe he feels like he can get a little more run. So to see him back, that was just the first thing that was noticeable to me was that he was still here. And, you know, that like, you know, seeing Bryson Jackson's back on the, the workout board as well. And just guys that you weren't quite sure that maybe had a decision to make that weren't. Um, did Bryson Jackson come out with a public announcement at one point? I don't. Oh, I, I don't, don't think, think he did, so. right? No, but so, he'll be back. Like, yeah, think, yeah, but he could have left, though, like, yeah. is what I'm saying. And so, yeah. like, that springboard is, is cool because that – otherwise, we would know Fleeks was still on the team, honestly. Right. Um, but I'm glad he's back. I think there's, there's something untapped there for him, but – I am not expecting him to be the starting running back on this team. He he just there's no way he's carrying the load that Abram Smith carried last year. There's just no way he's not built that that like that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, can he give you a little curveball? Can he give you something a little different? Give you a little spice? Yeah, um, I'm rooting for Josh Fleeks. I want him to make a big impact before it's all said and done. So I'm kind of glad that, that at least means that they're looking for something to get you know something for him to fit in doing and. Uh, you know, he's got the speed. We know that. So let's see how it works out in uh, in the running back room this spring. So, yeah, I, I don't know uh, expectations-wise what to think right now, but I I'm just, you know, glad that, that they've got him as an option. Uh, Scotty also asked, I know Baylor's 2-5 and all-time with college game day for football and basketball. So which player or players must have a big game against KU on Saturday so we can get our third win with game day involved? I mean, simply put, Akinjo and Flagler have to play really, really good basketball. And they're going to have to score. I mean, this team just doesn't have a lot of scorers. So those two guys are going to have to carry a big load offensively. And then I would also say kind of the wild card is Flo Thombass to play really well. Um, he cannot get dominated on the glass. Like, they have to be able to rebound. Yeah. And Flo is, is the guy who's going to have to deal with David McCormick uh, down low. And that's a tough task. And, you know, he's going to have to stay out of foul trouble because, frankly, if this team is out on the court without Flo Thamba against David McCormick, they're probably giving up a dunk every single time. Like, they just don't have the size inside. So, I would say those three, obviously, I would love to see Matthew Meyer, Jeremy Sohan, Kendall Brown play well. And they're going to play a key role. Don't get me wrong. They're going to have to play well. But I think those three guys are the three that, in this particular matchup, have to play well. And going forward, I mean, if there's no crier, I mean, this team literally is going to come down to can Flagler and Akinjo get you, you know, 35, 40 points. I mean, it just is what it is based on consistency and how these guys have scored. They need those two to really carry the load offensively. Thanks, Scotty. Doc Crowell, I've been following the SNC strength and conditioning Twitter to see the top lifters. Obviously, we found out about Fleek swapping the running back through it. What players are making the biggest impact in the weight room? Yeah, and I've mentioned this, you know, Fleeks has – played running back since last spring you know he's been kind of in and out and uh, he didn't play a whole lot this year at wide receiver either dude i so thought he I, wasn't even on the team at I one know, point yeah. like honestly like honestly i, I remember i shot colt colt to text it was like mid-season or something and i was like is josh fleek still on the team do you like is there something that i'm missing out because i was just 
I was I don't remember even what I was looking for. Um, and it may have been about the time that McGuire had left or something. Maybe that's what we got me thinking about it. I don't know, but he was like, you know what? I don't know either. And then we saw him the next week. He was out there, just like special teams or something like that. But yeah, not not really a role carved out no. is what you were getting at. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like I don't know that we necessarily just found that out. Like they've been looking at what they're how they're gonna utilize him. And so yeah, yeah listed running back. Uh, as far as guys making a big impact, uh Ben Sims, uh he's a guy that I know he's made the list a lot and he he's made a big strides in the weight room, which is no surprise. You know, older guys like Dylan Doyle has been on the list a ton. Um, I I think the ones that are kind of hidden that have really done a good job, and I I think they're kind of guys that you need to maybe focus on going forward. Cameron Bonner has really made some gains in the weight room, has done a really nice job. He's made the list quite a few times, which is really encouraging. Gavin Byers, uh, he's been the top offensive lineman on the boards. I mean, he has been fantastic uh, in the weight room throughout the off season. I think the top running back right now is actually Tay McWilliams as far as number of times he's been on the list. Um, and then at DB, it's kind of a mixed bag based on what I've kind of heard and seen. Uh, Alfonso Allen has done a nice job in the weight room. AJ McCarty, a guy that a lot of people are excited about. And then Chateau Reed as well. Another guy that I know a lot of people are kind of curious, you know, how are McCarty and Chateau Reed going to fit in to this defense this year and in the coming years. And they need a lot of depth at defensive back and in particular cornerback. Uh, So hopefully those two guys have made strides enough to where they could be considered in the two deep. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm just doing kind of my loose review of uh, last year. I put the corners at a B plus, and I, I, it's kind of hard to, to whittle down and like choose because, man, you could, if I wanted to be loose with it, I could give like half the team A pluses, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave that for like the really special. So I'm being kind of stingy on the grades. So I had B plus for the corners just because, um, I, I'm trying to think of what my reasoning was. I mean, I know what the other groups I'm scoring and they're all going to be scored a little bit higher. I think the cornerbacks really benefited from what was around them, behind them and in front of them. But I think every group benefited from every group. Like this defense was just so solid throughout every single position group. But looking at the corners, yeah, there's a lot of, all right, is he ready to play? Because they're, they're going to be, you know, introducing some new folks next year. And uh, we really only know about like Mark Milton and we know um, who's the other, uh, we get know about Walcott obviously, but like, Outside of that, man, it's, you know, is A.J. McCarty ready? Is, you know, who's next after that? Because there's, like, no playing time amongst the rest of these bodies. So Him and Chateau Reed, I mean, those yeah. are two guys that a lot of people have been looking at. And I think you're probably right. I would honestly, I might even rank them lower than that. Like, you know, if but you were going to be plus. Yeah, I mean, if you were to look at kind of what they did throughout the season, I mean, everything changed for them at the midway point mm-hmm. when Al Walcott got the start. Yep. But before that, they really, I mean, you know, Raleigh Tejada struggled at times throughout the year. Even Kalen Barnes really was not as impressive as I thought he would be. I actually think he would have benefited from coming back and improving more. Might not even get drafted now unless he runs crazy well. So, yeah, I think if you were to look at a weakness on that defense, I, I think it was the the cornerbacks. I mean, it, it was, yeah. you and know. I was not going to go any lower than a B. I, I want to say I said B+. Plus. Uh, probably should have gone more of a B if I yeah, didn't. But, it's... you know, but they weren't, like, bad. Um, no. I just think that they really benefited from their safeties, from their linebackers, from their D line, yeah. for you know, and I think that they definitely got some of their warts covered up because they didn't have to cover as long because of the pass rush or um, you know what whatever the case may be. They kind of got to camouflage themselves a little bit. They were also a very good, experienced group, but I, I do think my my reasoning, for, I mean, kind of just looking ahead, was all right. You know about a couple of their starters, but I mean, is is. Milton and Walcott, like something you feel great about. I mean, I, I think feel he, great as Milton being in your two deep. I right, don't feel, yeah, I don't right. feel great about him being your but starter. But right now, he'd yeah. be kind of listed as probably your starter, and then your backups have like little to no sure. experience. So, yeah, I was like in that B, B plus uh, range for those guys. But uh, one name I wanted to mention um, was Cam Bonner. I'm seeing a lot of him yeah. on these uh, workouts. Did you mention him? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't know if you did or not. But uh, yeah, I've seen his name, seen Dabney a he's lot the on top there. receiver. Cam Bonner right now. Okay. Yeah, he's been the top top uh, weight weight getter, weightlifting guy so far this offseason. Okay. So 
that's impressive. Yeah, you mentioned Dabney. He and Sims have kind of been trading off. Mm -hmm. um, ben has been tremendous in the weight room uh, early on. And uh, Gavin Byers just, I mean, that guy has been on the offensive line list a ton. And I know there's high expectations for him. And there's a position that needs to be filled. And he's been on the list a ton. So uh, he's trying to make his way towards good graces coming into the spring to where maybe he's the, the starter next year at uh, the guard spot. Yeah, potentially. Uh, looking at their latest update from yesterday, TJ Franklin on the D-line, Gavin Byers, Victor O.B. Ben Sims, Dylan Doyle, Tay McWill or no, excuse me, that would be Squirrel Williams, actually. Yeah. Tay's been on there a lot, though. Yeah, he has. Yeah. Uh, Drones has been on there quite a bit at quarterback. Uh, I did see Shapin mentioned the other day. Mm -hmm. um, That's but, good news. Yeah, McCarty and Allen at DB, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, check out the Baylor Strength and Conditioning. They, they put that out almost every day, and it's good to kind of keep up uh, with what's going on doc also asked what does tay mcwilliams need to do to win the starting job he's a junior now perform well in mop-up duty but the fleeks move seems to say grimes isn't confident in him i don't know if it says that because for one i said this a moment ago josh fleeks is not getting abram smith carries next year no unless we want to see him die i mean like i mean <laughs> that is not happening or unless he puts on 20 pounds yeah. in an off season yeah. yeah and suddenly changes everything about himself basically um you know running straight ahead running physical all that kind of jazz so what do you think it says if anything about tate mcwilliams i don't think it's that's all fleeks says everything about mcwilliams and not being confident but it, it does make me wonder of like abram was so good yeah. that you know, I am kind of curious of, of how confident they are in that running back room. I think it says more about the fact that they're still very young in the running back room and inexperienced. And I, I think it's actually smart of Jeff Grimes to explore every single option possible and also look at the transfer portal as well. You know, I, I think it's such an important position in this offense. I mean, when you look at what Jeff Grimes did at BYU with Tyler Algier, and then you look at, uh, at Baylor with Abram Smith and Tristan Ebner, you know, he really favors those kind of, I guess, senior laden, those kind of guys with experience, the guys that they can really ride on and be every down backs like Abram and Algier were in his offensive system. And so when I look at Tay McWilliams, I'm not necessarily sure I see a guy that can handle that kind of workload. And that's why I've kind of always been of the belief that he and Jordan Jenkins are kind of going to split that that workload as far as getting carries and then fleeks might kind of flex into kind of try to take over the uh, trust and ebner role in the offense for next year you know as a pass catcher and a guy that they can do multiple things with but i'm not sure i see jenkins or tay mcwilliams just all of a sudden getting you know the high level carries that abram smith was throughout the season um i actually think that jordan jenkins body is actually more fit for that down the line um but i think he and mcwilliams are going to split those carries and mcwilliams probably will get the starting job next year if they don't get anyone from the transfer portal but i don't think that necessarily means that he's going to be getting carries like abram smith did i think you have to earn that and to me, I just think it's going to be really hard to take away carries from Jordan Jenkins or vice versa. And I think they're going to play all three of them, to be honest. And you might even see Squirrel. I mean, that, that's a possibility as well. It might be more of a committee than it was this year. Yeah, I definitely think it will be. I don't think they've got that guy um, necessarily. And they're young. That's the thing. Yeah, like, you, there's no one proven that they right. can do that. And so, you know, we'll see. I think Tay just needs to continue working hard and continue proving that he can take care of the football and that he can maintain high level of play even while taking a bunch of hits. You know what I mean? Like, Abram got better as games went on. Is Tay going to be able to do that with his body frame? I don't know yet. I'll tell you what would definitely help out the running backs next year is a passing game that they yeah. can rely on yeah. consistently. That would go a long way to help out, you know, and help ease that transition from Abram and knowing what you have to a group of guys and just kind of figuring out what you have. Uh, all right, Alpha Needle, what are the scenarios we need to happen to get a one or two seed in the NCAA tournament? Oh, I, I think Baylor's probably going to have to win – out <laughs> probably you i gotta mean, win the big 12 tournament i would think if you beat kansas if if you we're win, talking one seeds yeah if you yeah. went out in the regular season i think they will be right there i think they'll be right there to getting a one seed if they lose once the loss has to come to someone or i guess if you lose to kansas again then your other wins really aren't all that impressive so you'd probably have to win the big 12 tournament to get a one seed so i would probably say you either have to go four and oh to end the year and then maybe win one big 12 tournament game to get a one seed or 
you go three and one with the loss being to Kansas, and then you probably have to win oh, maybe two games in the Big 12 tournament, maybe win the Big 12 tournament to get a one seed. I mean, the problem is, is like Kansas' schedule is really, really easy, and their their body of work looks like they'll probably get it. Arizona's schedule is a cakewalk. Gonzaga is getting a one seed. Like, that, there's no doubt about that. And then you're kind of looking at Baylor, uh, Kentucky, Auburn are kind of, I think, the teams that are, and Purdue, are the teams kind of hanging out there for that last one seed. So, I mean, they're going to have to be more impressive than those teams if they want a shot at it. And honestly, a lot of people are talking about, oh, Baylor's like outside my top 10 in my rankings. And that's cool. People can have that belief. And honestly, based on what I've seen, I, I, I agree with them. But it's body of work for the NCAA tournament. It has nothing to do with eye test. It is what's your resume. And I, Baylor's resume is pretty dang good, honestly. They, they can improve it, and they need to improve it to get a one seed. But it's pretty dang good at the moment. Bear Love 89, any Blake shape and recovery updates as he go in through spring practice? Well, spring practice hasn't started yet and won't for a few more weeks. So we won't have an answer on that for you know another two, three weeks or so until we get out there and see for ourselves. Um, but he's working out. Uh, he was on, like we mentioned a second ago, he was on the you know workout or weightlifters of the day chart. I think it was over the weekend maybe or late last week we saw his name. So he's, he's in the weight room. To what extent? I mean, uh, I don't know. There might be more private talk on the message boards and whatnot, but nothing to report right now. Yeah, I, so I mean, I saw, I think it was maybe a month or so ago, he's been doing training. You know, he's been doing training with quarterback coach of some kind. So I'm not going to sit here and say he will for sure be ready to go for spring practice, but I can say the rehab seems like it's going really well if he's able to do these kind of activities and then go do weightlifting as well. I would say that things are trending in a good direction for Blake Shapin. Yep, uh, I think so. De I mean, farther along, and, and I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to sound like I know anything of what's going on with him, quite frankly, of like progressing or whatever, but... I mean, based on the way some people were talking right after the season ended, like this is already miraculous that he's even weightlifting, you know, based on the way that's I was like, he's never going to throw a football again. It was like, yeah. it was crazy. So, uh, yeah, it's good to see him on that weightlifting chart. And we'll know here pretty soon of, of how involved he'll be on the football side of things. All right, let's roll through these. Uh, Bear Coog, does Baylor or Texas Tech make it further in the big dance? Uh, real quick. I'll I do want to answer Zwatanejo Bear's message because okay. he deleted it. But yeah. I want to ask it because it's, it's a funny one. He said, if you could only have one, would you rather have tournament rounds one and two in Fort Worth or regional in San Antonio? Grayson, try to be objective. Regional in San Antonio, for sure. Instead of the first two rounds, definitely gives you a better shot at making the final four. Okay. Definitely San Antonio. And that's me being objective, but it's, it's better to be closer to home in those bigger games. Total homer pick. Uh, Bear <laughs> Coog, does Baylor Texas Tech make it further in the big dance right now? I'm saying Texas Tech does. If if LJ Cryer doesn't play the rest of the year, then it has to be Tech, sadly. Yeah. It just does. I mean, it is what it is. They're playing really well. Yeah. I mean, they're in a good spot. And, I mean, they're legit national championship contender. I mean, especially when they get it going. You know, they're not going to be able to play in Lubbock every time. And, yeah. and their fans will travel, but they're not going to be, like, as up close and in your face is like they are in Austin at these tournament games, but uh, they'll be loud, I'm sure, and, and yeah, Texas team you gotta have uh, on the lookout. Uh, but right now, yeah, I'm definitely taking Tech. Uh, does Bruce Weber from K-State get fired if they don't make the tourney? Ah, he's been there for a while, but they, they seem to have a long leash for him. Yeah, they, they, they do. seem to like It's K-State basketball, done. you know? It's like, what what are the expectations? Yeah. And he made frankly. an Elite Eight, what, two or three years, yeah, three years ago or so? Ago. Um, I don't think I don't think he'll get fired. I, I personally don't. No, and I, I have not even heard or paid really attention to any of the chirping as far as that goes, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, just Googling his name here real quick, because I don't know if that was a question that's just honestly just like a, out of the blue or if there's maybe a reason why you're asking, which, of course, is K-State's <laughs> record and what they're doing. That's your reason for asking. But um, I do see an article from like three weeks ago, time running out for Bruce Weber to deserve – to prove he deserves another season. And, you know, there's some comments like that, but I don't see much 
much talk. Maybe there's more of it on Twitter. Uh, but, no, I would think he probably gets a little bit longer on that leash. But, um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, it's an awfully competitive league, right? And you don't want to – you know, a lot of it depends, too, on what K-State's expectations are. But, as you said, they haven't been without success entirely. Right. Just uh, a little bit of a rough run right now. Uh, all right. Uh, Bear Coog also d- – uh, hot take. Texas Tech is an early-round exit in the big dance. Uh, they are top heavy, and I think a smaller sized, lower C team who's faster and happens to be hot will take them down. Plus, they play physical and pushing small guys around will lead to numerous foul calls on them in attorney with rest from other leagues. So uh, there's Bear Coog chiming in. Yeah, and I can see that. I mean, Tech Tech does not score great, and Tech does not have an alpha. I mean, Bryson Williams is start sort of becoming that, but they don't necessarily have an alpha score, nor do they have a great point guard, which seems, you know, that that's a problem in the tournament. Oh, that if they ever get a is. tight whistle, they are screwed. Right. I mean, they really are. I mean, that's, and I'm not saying that negatively, but I mean, that's, that's true. That's a good point is if they get one of those situations, they're going to be like, wh- they're, they're, they're going to think it's yeah. fixed or something, but it's just going to be somebody calling it the way that, you know, yeah. some call it. Well, and I also think if you play defense, if, even if they allow physical play, if you play a defense that's allowed to get away with that on their guards, mm-hmm. on their point guards, specifically i think they will turn the ball over and have some yeah. issues so I, I if they get a bad matchup i could absolutely see them losing early but the problem is is you know that's your hot take and that's fine but if baylor doesn't have lj crier they could absolutely lose in the first weekend like it would not surprise me at all bears then uh, thank you bear coog uh bears then the basketball team has been snake bitten this season with injuries how much of this is just a bad luck and how much could it be something we aren't doing right in the training staff? Yeah, I think de- it's. Yeah. Hold on, yeah, I tend to think it's just bad luck, but curious if our training or strength and conditioning could play a part. Yeah, I, um, no, I mean Charlie Melton's been around for like a billion years at this point. They know what they're doing. I think they're snake bitten, man. I mean, it's just one of those things. I mean, look at last year; nothing's changed to to go from just pure health all year long outside of COVID to injury after injury after injury. I mean, that, that's just that to me is just snake bit you're just snake bit rotten luck and you know last year you were greatly uh aided by the fact that you did not have a bunch of lasting lingering long and injuries especially to your key players and it just so happens that it's the complete opposite this year yeah and i mean if you look back a little ways you know 2019 the tristan clark injury is the one that everyone talks about um which makes sense but you also have to remember makai mason basically missed every other game that year (laughs) do you remember that i mean the guy was literally playing with one leg it felt like and was still playing at a high level but my point of that is like it happens. And then even in 2020, for as good as that team was in 2020, they finished really poorly because Macy Oteague injured his wrists. And things seemed a little shaky at the end of that season because of it. So these injuries happen. Um, but I think Baylor's done a nice job of taking care of them because if you look back throughout you know, the past few years, they've had a couple injuries here or there, but they haven't had a ton like this on one team. So I think it's just bad luck, like you said. They're, they're kind of snake bitten this year, and it's really unfortunate because you're seeing a team that it just seems inevitable that they're going to have you know struggles in the tournament. It just seems that way if they don't get healthy. Yeah, um, there's time, but time's running out, and, and time's not on their side in terms of some of these injuries getting healed up all the way where you'd like them to be. So, yeah, they're going to have to battle. They're going to have to to go to war with a little bit of injuries already you know, uh, in, you know, in tow, but, uh, man, if they can get a little bit of a health blessing, that would go a really long way for this team. So we'll, we'll see what happens, but yeah, right now this is, this has really been a year of look, I mean, especially with what they've dealt with, it's been even more impressive, quite frankly, you know, when you want a national title, people get kind of spoiled. I think everybody does. You're just like, that's the, I gotta win it again. And you know, here they are and they're 21 and five or whatever. And you'd <laughs> think that they were, 10 and 10 or something, um, you know, it's kind of a feeling because there's like this foreboding, this ominous sense of like, uh Oh, what's in store next? Just because, you know, of all these injuries and whatnot. So, um, yeah, it's going to be very fascinating to see kind of how this plays out these next few weeks for this basketball team, but do appreciate the question. And, uh, we will see as, uh, they've got the big one with Kansas college game day on Saturday in Waco, big opportunity to come out and 
check out the college game day crew and be a part of a good atmosphere on Saturday and a big weekend spring sports. Uh, so hopefully there's a lot of people making their way to, to Waco this weekend. Uh, but Grace, anything before we go? No, no, just an exciting weekend. Uh, it's going to be a really, really fun game and an opportunity for Baylor to continue building this brand that they've built under Scott Drew. I mean, this basketball program is tremendous and another chance against the team that's dominated the Big 12 for many, many years. Yes, uh, so college game day, you got baseball, softball, women's basketball, all that good stuff. We'll be talking about all the results next week. And, of course, uh, talking about these results and all the news and notes that are out there as well uh, constantly, 24-7 over on the premium section of Sikkim365.com. Definitely go out uh, and take advantage of a membership if you haven't already. I want to thank uh, Jack and uh, Armstrong behind the scenes uh, for running the show as well. And for Grayson Grunhafer, I'm Craig Smoke, and we will talk to you next week. This has been the Bearcast on Sikkim 365 Radio, Sikkim365.com.